Thomas Merton once said, even the darkest moments of the liturgy are filled with joy. And Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the Lenten fast, is a day of happiness, a Christian feast. It cannot be otherwise, Merton said, as it forms part of the great Easter cycle. Lent is not a season of punishment so much as a season of healing. Welcome. Welcome to this service of mortality and morality on Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent. This service tonight centers on these two words, not because your Baptist preacher loves alliteration, or not only because of that, but because mortality and morality are what the scripture lessons for Ash Wednesday invite us to ponder in this space. In the prophet Joel's announcement, we will hear mountains that shout. We will fear, feel people tremble, and we will watch as thick darkness spreads out across the land. We will face mortality. In Jesus' teaching in Matthew's gospel, we are told clearly and succinctly and poetically how we are to live out our brief lives before that darkness settles over us. We hear in Jesus' words, morality. Ash Wednesday is a somber day and a dark day because Jesus now sets his face toward Jerusalem, toward Golgotha, to face his own mortality and morality. And Jesus looks over his shoulder tonight at us, at each and every one of you, and says some good words to live by until we all get there. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Will you stand as we pray together our prayer of confession in your bulletin? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Because I know my wrongdoings, my sin is always right in front of me. And yes, you want truth in the most hidden places. You teach me wisdom in the most secret space. Let me hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Please don't throw me out of your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Return the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me with a willing spirit. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. You don't want sacrifices. If I gave an entirely burned offering, you wouldn't be pleased. A broken spirit is my sacrifice, God. You won't despise all. If you'll take your hymnal, we'll sing our assurance of forgiveness, number 178. <laughs> Thank you. 
reading from the, po from the prophet Joel. Blow the horn in Zion. Give a shout on my holy mountain. Let all the people of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and no light, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon, upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes, unlike any that has ever come before them, or will come after them in centuries ahead. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your hearts, with fasting, with weeping, and with sorrow. Tear your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love and ready to forgive. Who knows whether he will have a change of heart and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering or a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the horn in Zion, demand a fast, request a special assembly. Gather the people, prepare a holy meeting, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants. Let the groom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the porch and the altar, let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep. Let them say, have mercy, Lord, on your people, and don't make your inheritance a disgrace, an example of failure among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Here ends the first lesson. Let's pray. God of our salvation, we long to be reconciled to you. Help us to clear away any obstacle that prevents us from accepting the grace of Christ. No matter what we face in this life, increase in us knowledge and patience, kindness and holiness of spirit, genuine love and truthful speech, so that by the power of God at work in us, we may live even as we are dying and rejoice even in our sorrows. Though it may seem that we have nothing, if we are reconciled to you, O Lord, we have everything. And so, knowing that, leaning into that, hoping for that, we now pray our acquiescence to you and our hopes and our fears. We pray them boldly, just as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now the gospel lesson for the evening from the gospel according to Matthew. Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may give to the poor in secret. 
Your father, who sees what you do in secret, will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to, stay, to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. And when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They distort their faces so people will know that they are fasting. I assure you that they have their reward. When you fast, brush your hair and wash your face. Then you won't look like you are fasting to people, but only to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth, where moth and rust eat them and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourselves in heaven, where moth and rust don't eat them and where thieves don't break in and steal them. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here ends the gospel lesson. On Ash Wednesday, the lectionary gives us a section of the Sermon on the Mount that even those who aren't regular churchgoers are fairly familiar with. In Matthew 6, Jesus addresses the matter of doing faith, of doing faith. While there is a believing aspect to our faith, it is long seemed to me that Jesus is equally, if not more so, concerned about the doing of faith. In this evening's gospel lesson, Jesus pulls out and holds up three practices Three things that faith does. If you are here tonight still unsure of what you might do for the season of Lent, well, Jesus just gave you three ideas. Maybe you could do one or two, or if you're really ambitious, you could take on all three of them at the same time. Jesus suggests in his most famous sermon that these three ways are ways in which Christians can and should do faith. The epistle of James later says it in an equally well-known way. Faith without works is dead. As I considered these three moral teachings of Jesus for this sermon tonight, I thought at first that I would do that thing that Baptist preachers do, you know, open with a joke, talk about three points, and then wrap it up at the end, right? There's three things Jesus talked about. It fits the bill. The more I pondered that idea, though, the more I realized that it was completely unnecessary. Unlike in so many places in the Bible, here Jesus is not unclear. Give money to the poor, pray, fast. We all know what these things mean. We may choose not to do them, but we hear them on the lips of Jesus tonight on the first day of Lent here. So instead of that, I want to spend this time tonight with you attending to a particular word in this gospel lesson that hangs us up. We hear the word three times in this relatively short reading. Three times Jesus tells us to do our faith not as the hypocrites do. Hmm. 
The word hypocrite is one that gets hurled around our culture at lethal velocity, right? The word hypocrite is one that conjures in everyone a certain mental image, a loose working definition, and everyone then locks and loads the image and fires it out as fast as they can. Everyone has a mental image and a loose working definition of the word hypocrites. We get fasting and praying. We get giving to the poor. But if I were to ask you, what is a hypocrite? How do you define that word? I imagine that I would get all kinds of different answers. Born from all kinds of images that you have in your head and heart. So the questions I have of this text tonight are, what is a hypocrite? And how does knowing that help me understand what Jesus is asking me to do? First things first, a brief word study. Now I know you're excited about that. You came tonight to learn about Greek words in the Bible, right? But it's important. Hypocrite is not a translation of a Greek word. Hypocrite is a transliteration of a Greek word. That means that the English word we use is simply a Greek word that we have subbed in English letters for. We do that for proper names in the Bible and some words. That means that we took the Greek word and just matched up English letters to it. A translation of a Greek word, like pneuma, would be spirit. That's what pneuma means. But the transliteration of a Greek word, like Hippocrates, is hypocrite. You see the difference. We know what the one is, but the other one doesn't help us. If you flip through the dictionary and you looked up a word and the definition was the same word that you looked up, you didn't gain anything by the meaning. When we translate pneuma, we ask which English word means the same thing as this Greek word. When we transliterate Hippocrates, we simply rewrite the Greek word with English letters, and we create a new English word. What all that means for us tonight, reading this text, is that we have a new word with a new meaning to learn. When words get transliterated from one language to another, their meanings become ambiguous. They become impressionistic in our minds. We say things like, well, I can't precisely define what a hypocrite is, but I know one when I see one. Right? Yeah. That leaves us with a blurry image, a imperfect definition, and each to their own understanding of this Greek word. Interestingly enough, Hippocrates can actually be translated into English. Yeah, it really can. Hippocrates, translated into English, matches the English word actor. Actor. So, in Matthew 6, Jesus says... Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the actors do in the synagogues and in the streets. And when you pray, don't be like the actors who love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners. And when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the actors. In the ancient world... Actors were people who interpreted lines of epic poetry, like Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. 
They would have stood on the stage of an amphitheater and acted out the lines for an audience. They were actors in a play. When we actually translate this word Hippocrates to read actors, these lines of Jesus get a whole lot richer with all the metaphor that Jesus is playing with. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the actors do in the synagogues and in the streets. Ancient actors wore masks. They wore masks on stage that had around the mouth a trumpet-shaped opening because there was no fill in the sound booth way back when. And people needed to hear the lines. So these trumpet-like mouths on these masks projected the sound out to the audience. The mask mouthpieces would make the actor's voice huge, larger than life, exaggerating the actor's presence so as to please and impress other people. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the actors do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they might get praise from people. Do you hear that? You hear what Jesus is doing there? When you pray, don't be like the actors who love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners. Ancient actors, by definition, stood on stages surrounded by crowds of people with the goal to impress and entertain. That is the job. An actor wants to be heard. An actor longs to be seen and applauded. An actor lives for a standing ovation. But when you pray, don't be like the actors. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. And when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the actors. This one's my favorite. Many of you have probably been to the theater and even if it was back in high school, you went for some play. And on the sign outside the theater, you probably remember seeing two little white masks, one a little higher than the other one, and a face exaggerated into a joyful smile. And the other one, a little lower than that one, the face twisted into an agonizing frown. You've seen that image, I'm sure. It's on a black background, probably with the name of the theater around it. Today, those symbols are just symbols of the theater, of plays. But in the ancient world, those were the masks. That's what they looked like. They were hyperbolic, they were exaggerated, they were stereotypical because the amphitheater's big and the people in the back need to know which actor they're looking at, which personality is speaking and moving around the space. The masks worn by actors, exaggerated expressions, defined the character being played, but hid the actor from view. You don't see the person, the real person, underneath the caricature of the mask. When you fast, don't put on a sad face like the actors. They distort their faces so that people will know that they are fasting. As I pondered this gospel lesson for our service tonight and did some digging around the word hypocrite that appears three different times in this short lesson, 
I began to see a lot of value in translating that word into actor rather than simply transliterating it. When translated as actors, we see and hear the metaphor that Jesus is using. It is rich and full of imagery that you and I experience each and every time we go to the movies, each and every time we go to the Tennessee theater to see a play, or anything like that. And when it's translated as actors, it keeps me from reverting back to all those vague, ill-defined notions of what a hypocrite is. You know, that thing that I say, well, I know it when I see it. It keeps me away from that, which is so judgmental. When you give to the poor, when you pray, when you fast, Jesus says, don't act. Don't stand proudly on the stage of life and look for accolades. Don't project or modulate your voice to some sound that it doesn't naturally make. Don't wear masks who hide who you really are, but rather come to God as you. You were God's idea in the first place, the real you, not the one behind the mask. You are God's careful, beloved creation. And because of that, you is precisely what God wants here tonight in this space and all throughout the season of Lent on the way to Easter. So, even in church, beloved, even in church, especially in church, let's put aside the pretension. Let's speak with our own voices and no one else's. Let's come to Christ as we really, truly are. I believe with all my heart that if we do that, the Spirit will have something and someone to work with this Lenten season. May it be so. Easter's coming. We stand as we sing together our hymn, number 168, I Take the Cross of Jesus Christ.
turn back one page in your hymnal, let's read together the reading, 40 days and 40 nights. The rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Elijah got up and ate and drank, then went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Lord God, who cleansed the earth through 40 days of flood, and gave your guiding law through 40 days of worship, who revived Elijah through 40 days of pilgrimage, Grant us grace to enter the flood, the fire, the desert. The penitence and the journey, the emptiness and the fasting. That leads us to Gethsemane and the dark scene of Golgotha. And leave us at the empty tomb to see your risen son. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. What we are up to tonight is odd, and it is interesting, and it is shot through with all kinds of meaning. This is one of the palm branches that you waved on the way into worship several months ago now for Palm Sunday as we celebrated Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Each year I save these in my office and then pull them out on Ash Wednesday and burn them here into ashes that we wear on our forehead in the shape of a cross. That cross, most simply, in the symbol of life to death, is a reminder to us that in life and in death, both, we belong to God. We're going to do this a little differently this year than we have in the past. Usually in the past, Beth and I have imposed the ashes on every forehead in the room. But tonight, we're going to do it differently. The ashes are here 
on the table. And as you come forward, Beth and I will impose ashes on the first person that comes to us. But from that point on, we invite you to dip your finger in those ashes, to turn around and impose ashes on the person behind you until everybody in the room has a cross-shaped smudge on their forehead. If you can't remember the words from Genesis that you're supposed to use in this moment, don't fret. They're right there on the front of the bulletin. So reach for that, come forward, and receive the ashes of Ash Wednesday. you have come, and to dust you shall return.